think we are very happy Recording to have with us back Pastor Albert Lee. He is no stranger to many of us. For those who do not know him, he worships at Emmaus Evangelical Free Church. And today he will be sharing with us from 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1 to 5. How then shall we live? Thank you. I'm no stranger, but at times I'm strange. And that's okay. Good to see uh, you all again, faithful people of the Lord, to come together on Sunday to worship Him together and to see how we can together learn to grow in Him and uh, serve Him. Since I read the book by Francis Schaeffer, How Then Shall We Live? Years ago, that might be a very strange name for the younger ones, but uh, Francis Schaeffer was quite popular nowadays, huh? How then shall I live? I have been asking myself this question, how then shall I live? And so this morning, the passage in uh, 2 Timothy 4, verse 1 to 5, I think answers that question, how then shall we live? So we will do that. And then next week, when we come back again, we will look at how Paul lived. Okay? How then shall we live? And then how did Paul live his life? Let's pray. Father in heaven, Thank you for your word. May your word uh, be used by you to convict us through the Holy Spirit that we may live in a way that is so different, perhaps strange to the people in the world, but in obedience and in following you. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Are we not living in the last of the last days? Is Christ written not imminent? Even the first generation Christians, disciples, were thinking about Christ's return. That's around nearly 2,000 years ago. Nearly, not yet. Huh? It's coming. Jesus Christ uh, was resurrected in the year 2, uh, 0, what? 32 or 33 or 34? 34. 34, more like that. Huh? I think around the 33. So really, you know, 2033 or 4, that's 2,000 years, okay? Coming, huh? 2,000 years is coming, okay? But even then, the first generation disciples of Christ were thinking about his return. And I want to turn to the Bible to show you that it is so in one in, in Matthew chapter 24, verse 1 to 8. Okay, so we read that Bible passage first before we look at today's Bible passage. Matthew 24, verse 1. Jesus left the temple and was walking away with his disciples, came to him to call his attention to his building. Do you see all this? He asked. Truly, I tell you, not one stone here will be left on another. Everyone will be thrown down. And as Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately and said, Tell us, they said, what will you when will this happen? And what will be the signs of your coming and the end of the age? Jesus answered, Watch out that no one deceives you, for many will come in my name, claiming I am the Messiah, and will deceive many. You will hear wars, rumors of wars, but see to it that you are not alarmed. Such things must happen, but the end is still to come. Nations will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines, earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginning of birth pangs. In AD 70, the Roman destroyed the temple and temple, the second temple, and fulfilled what Jesus said. Not one stone here will be left on another. If you know history, you know why is it that not one stone will be left on another. But let's move on. During the last 100 years, 19 people had claimed themselves to be the Messiah. Actually, you know, the word Messiah is a Greek word. In the Hebrew word is the anointed one. Okay? The Greek word is, uh, no, the Greek word, the anointed one is Messiah and the Greek word is Christ. Okay? You got it. Sorry. No, old minds. Today, uh, there are, so there's 90 people who came and said they are the Messiah the last 100 years. I don't know about the rest. Uh, Google told me now, if I'm not right, it's Google's fault. Okay? Jesus Christ said, you know, many come in my name claiming I'm the Messiah. After World War II, the war that should end all wars, right? There were more than 100 wars being fought. Today, we have several ongoing ones, right? And quite serious, right? 
Uh, even the Saudi recently said, you know, we are not with Israel, right? Too excessive, right? Uh, Saudi that was about to sign the Abraham Accord with Israel is now moving back. And all this tells me, you know, something is going to happen according to Bible prophecy. So, you know, uh, if, if, if Iran hit back and Israel hit back and we hit the oil fields, then you know what's going to happen, right? Some more inflation. Because uh, uh, oil has to do with transportation, right? Okay, the pilot will tell you it is so. Nations will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. So now, currently, there are 10 nations experiencing famine. Last year, 1,712 earthquakes were recorded. That's what Jesus Christ says. There will be famines, earthquakes in various places. But Jesus said that all these are just birth pangs. Now, we guys know, but the ladies know what is birth pangs, right? Recurring pains that will increase in frequency until the baby is born, right? So we know the baby is coming, but when? We don't know. One hour, two hour, 12 hours, some ladies are very determined. Even they go through it for 16 hours, right? I know one lady who says, I must give birth to it naturally. Die, die or some. Okay. Not, no, not, not very good illustration. You know, mindful of Christ's return, therefore, Paul in chapter uh, 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1 said, Okay, the baby is going to be born. Mindful of Christ's return, he said in 2 Timothy 4, 1, I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and at and his kingdom. So the first thing that Paul told Timothy is this. How then shall you live? First of all, live for Christ's appearing. Right? I always ask Christians, what will happen when uh, you die? He says, heaven. I say, no, sorry. Before that, there's going to be judgment, right? Because here we read that the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge, right? When Christ appears, there will be judgment. Now, in the Bible, we are told that there are two judgments, okay? One at the great white throne, which is spoken about in the book of Revelation, where unbelievers will be judged. And then there is another judgment that is called the beamer seat. The word beamer is a Greek word that, said, that uh, talks about the raised part or the altar. You know, at the beamer seat of Christ, spoken about in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse, I thought, and so forth, Romans chapter 14, where believers will be judged. Okay, you got it? Two judgments. One, the great white throne. The other one, the beamer seat of Christ. Why will believers not be judged at the great white throne? Well, Romans chapter 8, verse 1 said, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Jesus Christ. And in John chapter 6, verse 40, a verse that some of us have memorized, everyone who look to the Son and believe in Him shall have eternal life, and I will raise Him at, up at the last days. So, Christians, we will not need to stand before the great white throne. But we will have to stand before the beamer seat of Christ, the judgment there. Well, 2 Corinthians 5 verse 10 tells us, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one must receive what is due to him for the things done while in this body, whether good or bad. We will not be judged for eternal damnation or eternal life, but we will be judged for what we have done when we are here in this body for good or bad. That's why the Bible encourages us in Matthew chapter 6, I think, 19 and 20. He says, do not store up treasures in, on, uh, do not store up for yourself treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy, where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourself treasures where? In heaven. Now, looking across here, I think many of us here don't look young anymore. We try to look young, but uh, everyone knows except us. You know, uh, and I look at myself recently. I had two of my friends. My friend was younger than me. His daughter and son-in-law came to visit me. Uh, then they took a photograph with me. Terrible. You know, it's, it's a sure reflection of youth and old age. You know, so we are no more young. Okay. 
Is it not time for us to reflect on what we have done with our time, our talents, and our treasures? Are we storing up treasures on earth? Recently, a friend of mine, 76 years old, told me that he took one year to declutter all the things he has. One of the new activities of old people is called decluttering. Right? It took him one year, he said. Uh, one, regret, one regret he had was to keep his prized rosewood furniture in storage for more than 20 years. Huh? You know, rosewood furniture, beautiful one, no, very nice. He said, Albert, I was waiting for the time when I get back to a landed property that I can deploy it again. You know what I mean? He loved it, but he kept it in storage for 20 years. Now, you can calculate how much rent he paid. Huh? If he, if he only, if the rental only cost him $200 a month, hmm, hmm, 20 more years. He said, Albert, I regret that I paid tens of thousands of dollars in rental. Those were money that I should have given away to help people and towards mission. So we all will have regret, right? I'm sure we all will have because we are not perfect. I will have my regrets, please. I'm not telling you. So you don't tell other people about my regrets. But I will have regrets at the beamer seat of Christ. So living for Christ appearing means what? When you say, I'm living for Christ appearing, what does it mean? It means that you must live for what will count for eternity. How then shall you live? How then should I live? How then should you live? Live for Christ appearing. And when he appears, there will be judgment. Not the great white throne, but the beamer seat of Christ, where he will ask us, what do you do with your time, talent, and treasures in this body? for good or for bad. Hmm. Finish? First, first point is over. Very fast, right? Today's sermon will be very quick. Wait until you see. Lah. Then Paul says to Timothy, in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 2 to 4, and we read, preach the word, be prepared in season and out of season, correct, rebuild, and encourage with great patience and with careful instruction. For the time, time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine, Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myth. So after telling Timothy to live for Christ appearing, now Paul tells Timothy to live with God's word. While you're here on this earth, live with God's word. You got it? Live for Christ appearing. Live with God's word. Afterward, test, no, afterward, you say hello to me, it's the very good sermon. I say, what's the three point? Then we know whether it's, you are lying or not. Today, we live in a world of information, misinformation, and disinformation, right? And this is the word that I never know about until recently when Trump became very prominent. That was about, say, eight years ago, right? Huh? Trump is famous for disinformation. Many who are deceiving are themselves being deceived. That's why their deceptions are so convincing, you see? They really mean it. When they are deceiving you, they really mean it. Because they themselves have been deceived. That's why deceptions nowadays are so convincing. That's why till today, there's still a lot of money in scam. People will not put up with sound doctrines. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn their ears away from the truth, turn aside to myth. To increase attendance, give to people what their itching ears want to hear. Entertain them with music that Give them emotional high. Tell them that God will give them grace without the need for them to repent. Tell them that God will always prosper them and they never need to suffer. Not bad, huh? Huh? That's good, no? God will always prosper me without me ever need to suffer. And that's a good message, right? Is it? Is it? Us turning away from truth to myth. So, 
Instead of doing that, Paul told Timothy, you must preach the word, be prepared in season and out of season, correct, review, and encourage with great patience and careful instruction. Why is the preaching, teaching, the proclamation of God's word critical? Well, we know this verse, right? 2 Timothy 3, verse 16 to 17. These are all verses that you and I had memorized because we have been Christian a long time. All scripture is God breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. See, earlier in chapter 4, uh, uh, earlier we mentioned in chapter 4, verse 2, preach, correct, rebuke, and encourage. Then, then earlier in this chapter, uh, in chapter uh, verse 3 to 17, we are told that we must be equipped for good works. Reflecting on my life. Do you reflect on your life? Reflecting on my life. I remember some faithful Bible teachers who preach and teach God's word to me. People like Ian Paulson. People like Howard Peskett. People like Alan Cashpool. Not entertaining, not very dull, some of them. But they faithfully teach me God's word. And then remembering myself in my younger years, older brothers and sisters in Christ also correct, rebuke, and encourage me. So all this has been done to me. Preach, correct, rebuke, and encourage. And then give you an illustration. One correction which I remember very, very vividly. Actually, I forgot, but my friend remembers and told me, and then I remember vividly. That's how it works, huh? You forget, then you're, remind, then you're reminded, then you remember. I never drive a car until I... I never have a driving license until I was 40 years old, and I never owned a car until I was about 48 or 50 years old. And my first car would be... I'm going to buy it. Woohoo, at last. Nearly 50 years old. Toyota Soluna. You remember that? Huh? You don't know that? That means you live in a different time. Now it's something else. Toyota Soluna. And I still was working you for Christ. I didn't have much money. And a friend said to me, Albert, I loan you the whole amount to buy the car. Wow. So I go to the board and I tell them I'm going to buy, you know, the board of directors of you for Christ Singapore. I said, a friend is going to loan me the whole amount to buy this car. He said, Albert, you shouldn't. You shouldn't. So they tell me why not. If you don't want to be beholden to this person, don't take the money. Then in my mind, the first thing I say, you all talk like this. You all give let me money or not. And that was the first thing that came to my mind. No? But I was corrected. And, I, and they were right to correct me. Because I would have been beholden to this person for the rest of my life and I will make decisions that will please him and may not please the Lord. So I was corrected. It was such a big blow to me, you know. You know, my board members telling me, and, but they, do, or not, they never say, oh, then Albert will help you. No. They never say the word. They just say, you shouldn't do it. But I was corrected. So that's one for you. Another one, rebuked. I was rebuked. By my wife. Ah, wife, rebuild husband, okay. Lah, huh? I guess they always do it. That's their, that's their job. Rebuild the husband. No one else was there to rebuild the husband, right? My wife said to me, Albert, and that was in my early years with Singapore Youth for Christ. So why are you still doing business? See, on the side while I was serving with Youth for Christ, I was doing a business. See, I was very insecure. Why you see salary cannot leave then? Can live for myself, but cannot live for my wife, and then they told my children. So on the side, I was doing a business. And my wife said to you, you know, you're doing the lost business or your own business, tell me. Oh, no, Mark, I did so. So she rebuilt me. And I gave up that business to my other friends. And one of them took most of my share. And then make it worse, ah, huh? in the few years' time, that business boom. And I see him driving a Mercedes Benz. And I was still taking bus. I was rebuked. I was rebuked. And I took it. Encouraged. 
when I was about to go into national service, her older sister, you may know her, and since it's good, I will tell you her name, Linda. You know, remember Belinda in SIM? She's my older sister. She got married to my older brother, Andrew Ng, who's now with the Lord. She said to me, Albert, you know, wherever you go, whatever you do, you do your best because that's worshipping God. Hmm. Whatever you do, wherever you go. You know, in those days, I'm, I'm the second or third dash NS now. <sighs> How do you say in Chinese? How do you say in Chinese? Uh, Hawkins says what? Okay. In those days that the go to the army is terrible, you know. Today, you know, it looks a bit good uh, because the marketing has been working. Uh, okay. But in those days, Chinese people don't do don't go to the army. It's an old, you know, they become scholar, but they don't go to the army. Okay. So she said to me, Albert, wherever you go, whatever you do, you do it the best as a worship to God. And so I listened to her and I became the best recruit and I became the best NCO and I was selected to be the first person to go to Port C to do officer training. And I said, no, because I know I want to serve the Lord in you for Christ. You see, those who preached, those who correct, those who rebuked, and those who have encouraged me have equipped me you see it? You see the connection in uh, 2 Timothy uh, verse uh, 16? All scripture is god brief, useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. It is the preaching of God's word, the correcting of brothers and sisters, the rebuking of those who dare, and the encouragement that had equipped me. Of course, they were doing all that in keeping with God's word. That's why in my lifetime, no, I have served in Singapore Youth for Christ. And during that time, I restarted Myanmar Youth for Christ. I started restarted Malaysia Youth for Christ. And just for good measure, since I'm such a busy body, I started now finish in Myanmar. Then when my time is up, with Youth for Christ, I was asked to establish the work of ODB internationally. And then towards the end, they asked me to help them in, uh, supervise the work in China and India. Then when my time is up, then while I was doing, uh, given up the international work and while I was uh, supervising the work in China and India, I know when I started international work, 34 countries, no? Now only two countries, are yeah, sub, sub, three, lah. So I went and helped in Mayor's church as a pastor. Now, as a retiree, I'm establishing a business as mission. How can I do it without the preaching of God's word, the correcting of my brothers and sisters who love me, the rebuking of those people who dare because they stand on God's truth, and, of course, the encouragement. The encouragement. Many times I want to give up. Many times. Many, many, many times. In fact, there was one time where I decided that I will just keep my letter of resignation. You know what I mean? I don't want to write and rewrite, you know? I write and then I want to submit, but then the Lord spoke to me and I tear it up and then write and, and then... No, no, I just had this permanent letter of resignation in my drawer because I wanted to resign so many times. But it is God's word, the correction, the rebuke of brothers and sisters of Christ, and the continual encouragement that kept me. It's equipping me. All this preach, correct, rebuke, encourage, equips us. Equips us. So nowadays, we can, people cannot tell us anything, right? People cannot tell us, you, hey, don't do it. No, today we are living in a world of torrent because we are intolerant. In our days, we never talk about torrents because we know we are torrent. But nowadays, you try to correct people. I try. The very moment you say something negative, your face changes. Right? Oh. We are living in a polite world. And in a polite world, you don't say anything negative. Is that happening in the church? Of course. The people who corrected me were very gracious. 
Of course, my wife, when she rebuilt me, I know she loves me. Of course, many were very wise to give me timely encouragement. And they always remind me of God's teaching and God's preaching. So don't just preach the word. We must walk alongside each other to teach, to correct, to rebuke, and encourage. You know, when I was in uh, my old church, formerly the same church with uh, Pastor John, uh, after the sermon, you know, what, what do you do after the sermon? Tell me. Hey, where do you eat, right? Right? Do you do it? Oh, no, you always eat here. So it's okay. But it's always where to eat. But you know what's the most disappointing for me? The food is good. And they always treat me because they say, you know, this poor missionary. So, okay, you don't have to pay. But you know what's the most disappointing? Always, at least I remember always, the conversation is not about what they have been just taught on the pulpit, but what's happening in the world. Hmm. Shouldn't you be talking about how God's word has impacted you and what you are learning after the sermon? No. What's happening in the world? Hmm. Interesting. So if you want to have good, gifted, and godly leaders, now we say in the church there are less and less of them. Is that so? Is it not because we have failed to preach the word, be prepared in season and out of season, to correct, rebuild, Encourage, oh, and of course, most importantly, with great patience and careful instruction. Some of the people, we had to be, have great patience with them. I'm not famous for patience. If there's a spiritual gift of patience, that's not mine. But we had to do it with great patience, with careful instruction. So now Paul tells us, how then shall we live? Live for Christ appearing. Live with God's word. And finally, he tells us in verse 5, but you keep your head in all situations and do a hardship, do the work of an evangelist, discharge all duties of your ministry. What is Paul saying? Firstly, he says, live for Christ's appearing. Secondly, he says, live with God's word. Lastly, he says, live for the gospel. Discharge your duties of your ministry, which is the work of an evangelist. This verse is applicable to all, no? Not just to Timothy. God's word is not just for that person, but for all of us who follow after. Two things is needed if we want to be involved in evangelism. Two things, okay? It's needed, are needed. Keep your head in all situations and endure hardship. Two things. Keep your head in all situations. Don't lose your head. Like that. That's what I'm trying to say. Like, huh? In the King James Version, it's translated, but watch thou in all things. Be watchful. Then in ESV, it is translated as always be sober-minded. To discharge the ministry of evangelism, we must be watchful and sober. To be sober means not to be intoxicated, right? That's what it means. Alcohol is not the only thing that intoxicates, right? We can be intoxicated by the need for more fame. We can be intoxicated by the need for more pleasure. We can be intoxicated by the need for more money. Intoxicated for the need for position and power and control. And the list goes on. The Bible succinctly states it as the last of the flesh, the last of your eyes, and the pride of life. So we have to be sober-minded. Not to be intoxicated. Be careful. We Christians are not wine drinkers, or are we? Or in my days, you know, we all are teetotaler which means we don't touch alcohol. But today, you know, standards are different. I hear of Christians who go public, public with each other. 
Christians going public. That one is, to me, a little bit beyond. Uh. Why not? Uh, if I go meet my friend, he give me a bit of wine. Okay, la, I always say, hey, I'm driving. Uh, so uh, make it small, the cup. Uh. What? Today, intoxication of alcohol, it's not frowned on the same way. And so yeah, I hear young people say we're going public. I don't even know how to pronounce the word properly. Pub, public. Which means they go there and drink wine, ah, a, a, a beer. Well, maybe not alcohol, maybe fame, recognition, maybe pleasure. What kind of pleasure? Food can be a pleasure, no? And I know it, I'm an expert. Thank the Lord, I realized, I finally, finally realized about six months ago that I don't live to eat, I eat to live. And so today you see less of me. Then so after saying that we must not, we must be sober-minded, watchful and sober-minded, don't be intoxicated by anything that the world has to offer, then Paul says you must be willing to suffer hardship. You want to share the good news? You have to suffer hard. hard. There's no money in sharing the good news. Huh? No money. Huh? Unless you are one of those evangelists who make sharing the gospel a business. Right? Now, some of you have uh, purchased poor tea from me to support the Akka ministry in China. Let me give you a latest update and you can pray for them. This ministry was started Supported in year 2006 by Emir's Church. And so when I went there to help Emir's in 2012 or 13, I think, I, I said, I decided to also, I need to look at this Akka ministry. And when I started to help them, I sensed the mood in China. And the mood in China tells me it's getting harder and harder for any work of evangelism. And so I asked them to, 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 to register a cooperative. And that's why we're selling tea. Okay, for them. But that was enough. Because this year in June, this year in June, all staff were invited to drink tea with the authorities. Not once, but twice. And then finally, they were all detained for 9 to 11 days. Now in China, detention center and jail is different. Huh? It's one level versus another level. But they were all detained for 9 to 11 days. Except for one who had kidney uh, uh, dialysis, and so they never took her in. I will not elaborate what they have to do, what they have to do in the 9 to 11 days. And you can ask me privately what happened. But basically, they were punished for sharing the good news publicly, which is illegal. And then they were having religious meeting outside of vaccinated church building. And then they were also receiving funds from outside for their work. That's why you had to register business in China. You had to let them earn the money. My church people said to me, oh, well, why are we going to buy tea from them? Now give them the whole money. Lah. Well, now they all keep quiet when they see me. I have a very strange effect on people. When they all were re released, I wrote this to them. I feel your pain. I also rejoice that you had the privilege to suffer for his name's sake. The devil knows that he is already defeated. The devil also knows that his days are numbered. He knows that. He's defeated. His days are numbered. So what is the only satisfaction that the devil have? You, you answer for me. What's the only satisfaction the devil have? He's defeated. His days are numbered. What's the only satisfaction that the devil have? But his only satisfaction is to bring as many as possible with him into eternal damnation. Right? I must bring more so that place which is hot will become hotter. Now I ask you then, we know what's the devil's satisfaction. More will turn away from God. 
more will join him in eternal damnation. Now, I ask you this question. What is your satisfaction? Well, my satisfaction is that I can ask some to join me with God with and have eternal life. That's my satisfaction. My satisfaction is not that I have millions of dollars in my bank account. Yes, I got it in rupees. But my satisfaction is that more will join me in God's almighty presence. And that's why Matthew 24 verse 14 means so much to me. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached to the whole world as a testimony to all nations. And the end will come. In some other translation, it goes, and this gospel of the kingdom will be preached to the ends of the world as a testimony to all nations. And then the end will come. So that's why two years ago, I was so thankful to God to help me realize that solar light, which I talked to you about last time, is a door opener, an eye opener, and a heart opener for those living in the end of this world, to those living in the end of, world, of the world to hear the good news. So we have redesigned and manufactured a new light. Not happy with the last one, because the last one we took from what is in the market is not durable. If I drop it, it breaks, but it's okay. It's okay. Drop it into the water for half a minute and pick it up, it's okay. Not happy with the last one because it's not good enough. And then now this one can be a ceiling light. It can be a wall light. It can be a table light. And it can be a handheld light, which is very important for those people like me, my age, had to go to a toilet in the middle of the night, right? And where is the toilet for old, old people in the remote area? Out house. And where is the out house? Not so close to the house because they don't want the smell, right? So a senior citizen can wake up in the middle of the night and carry the old light like that. Uh, uh, tup, tup. Now we say this is what you need. Why? Why do we do this all our life? I, I, honestly speaking, folks, don't, don't think I'm brilliant. I'm not. Actually, I'm quite okay. Lah. When this was shown to me the first time, I didn't see it, but the Lord has said, you too, lah, give you another chance. So he showed me the second time. You know, now people think I'm brilliant. And so, you know, in humility, I say, no, 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 no. I don't know whether it's real humility or not. But I found that this solar light is so easy for people to share the light of Christ. So easy. I've been getting reports after reports from people saying, hey, you know, it's so easy to talk about Jesus Christ. To talk about the light of the gospel to these people after you give them light. They live in darkness, suddenly light came and boom, darkness is gone. So what? It's so easy for us to tell them about Jesus is the light of the world. And his light in our life dispels all the darkness. This one man called Saul Sunday, you know. When people when you hear people say Reverend Saul Sunday, Reverend Saul Monday, Tuesday, you know he's a Karen. Because the Karen named their sons by days. So if you're born on Sunday, it's Saul Sunday. And one Tuesday is Tuesday, you know, that's how they do it. Not much imagination, but you know, it works. And so Saul Sunday, Reverend, finally discovered through the Anglican churches that there are 14 villages in the Dauna mountain region. Do you know where is it? There's a mountain region that separates Myanmar and Thailand. North part, southern part is a bit more like Mason and so forth. Okay? There's this mountain ridge. And on this mountain ridge, there are 14 villages of Karen people or Kayin people. And the gospel has not reached them yet. Believe it or not, till today, the gospel has not reached all the world, end of the world. Why? We know it has not reached them yet because they are all enemies. And so somehow, other, three years ago, don't know how they have discovered, I must find out more. They discovered that there are 14 villages of Karen people living up in the mo mountain range. They're all enemies and they have not heard the gospel. And so they went through education, through, through help of uh, medical, and now through light. They gave them the light. 
because they're up that mountain. Uh. Nobody knows them that they exist. Uh, so how to give them the electricity? Well, he told me last year, 105 people in two villages believe and were baptized. And then he says, there are 12 more villages. And I'm going to go into all the 12 more villages with the gospel. And I told Saul Sunday, you know, don't worry. I will make sure that every village will get this light. That's, that's my small part to help you bring the good news to the ends of the world. You see, in 1 Corinthians 4.4, 4, the Bible says, the God of this age has blinded the mind of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel that displays the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. So we must seize every opportunity. The, the gods of the world, the devil has blinded, darkened the eyes. They cannot see Jesus. And so we must seize every opportunity to share Christ. What Christ said in John 8, 12. I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but have your light of life. You know, I take comfort in the words of the Great Commission that we are asked to go and be witnesses, right? I take much comfort in that. You may say, oh, no, I don't know. But I take much comfort. You know why? The Bible could tell us that we are all converters, not witnesses. You see, my job is only to witness. God's job is converting. Aren't you glad? That you don't have to convert anybody. You cannot even convert yourself. Right? All I need to do is to open my mouth or do something that will tell people about Christ. That's why I love the words of Francis Assisi and Francis of Assisi who say, preach the gospel at all the times and if necessary, use words. Can we say it again? If you miss it the first time, preach the gospel at all times. And if necessary, use words. That means our life, our action, what we do can also be preaching the gospel. So therefore, brothers and sisters in Christ, let us use our time, talent, treasures to bring the good news to as many as possible. So Paul's charge to Timothy is also our charge. How then shall we live? Live for Christ appearing, where there will be judgment for unbelievers and believers. Then for believers, live with God's word. And finally, live for the good news or the gospel of Christ. Let's pray. Father in heaven, this is your word. Thanks be to you for your word. Lord, I pray that we will live in a manner that is pleasing to you. That we will live our lives uh, for Christ's appearing. We will live our life on this earth with your word. And Lord, our purpose in life is to live for the gospel. So that more, many more, will join us in your eternal presence. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.